bold in my intention. In this class, on this evening, is to destroy you. Completely, utterly, obliterate you. Okay? You will understand what that means by the time we do. Okay? But my goal here is not to build you up. I'm not a builder. I'm an architect, and I'm a destroyer. I just want to destroy you. That's all. Just give me an opportunity to do that. Uh, coming from West African thought and calculation, there's a couple of tenets that uh, we need to address first so we can come into a unified space and see how we want to apply it. Right. So we, we have some we have a nice grid of uh, maybe some common vernacular that we can share and we'll all understand what we're talking about. But let's start with some of the basic the basic terms that we're going to use. Uh, does anybody know what an African is? Okay, someone originated from the continent and spread by throughout the diaspora. By, by their DNA. By their DNA. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Uh, so we have some common working definitions. Um, certainly that is a biological and historical definition, and that is one that we will apply, but we'll also apply an African as one who is uh, the walking light encapsulated in the flesh. Okay. Af is fresh. Flesh. Ra is light or source. Ka is spirit. Okay. So, um, we have two working definitions that we work with. So when I say African, I want you to understand that I'm not necessarily talking about the Neo-African. Okay? I'm speaking about Africa and Africans more from a contextual perspective. Okay? I'm not speaking about modern-day Africans and a strive to be modern-day Africans. I'm not even speaking about an ambition, an aspiration, or striving to be ancient Africans. Can't do that either. If we were supposed to be ancient Africans, we've been born in ancient Africa. We chose to be born now. Okay, so we got to do some new stuff. So we're speaking about West Africa. Uh, can someone define an Orisha from this perspective? Okay, I'll say that um, when I think of Orisha and deity, uh, they all are aspects of God. Representation of the different um, levels of God. They are a ways, means, a mediums that we are able to communicate um, practices. Uh, from God, giving instructions from God. Uh, so they're representative, representative of different aspects of the divine. Okay. Representative of different aspects of the divine. Okay. Everyone cool with that? All right, sound like we covered a, covered a lot between those two. Okay. Uh, what is God? The Supreme Being. The Supreme Being. And even with all of that traditional information that I was given, uh, I decided to really understand what our tradition is today and what it was then. Okay? You know when I get the story? <laughs> Where it's coming from? <laughs> 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 I hope so. Okay. Okay. So, so that's the thing. Wait, the slink going off the door. <laughs> Here, let me give you a little precursor to that. See, a lot of times when teachers and lecturers come before us, they speak, they say things that motivate us. We jingle our keys, we say our shade, we hit djembe ribs, right on, black power, all that, right? And the community still jacked up. Because teaching, true teaching, is not supposed to be something that you agree with so much that it creates an emotional reaction. True teaching is supposed to be an offense to you. When you're really taught, you're offended. And I'll tell you why. Because your ego is offended by truth. When you're doing all of this, that's, that's his ego play. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm not here to agree with you and to say what you've been saying. If I'm here saying what you've been saying, then you wasted your money. You could have just recorded yourself and played it back to yourself. 
I'm here to offend your ego. Your ego is your blockage. In Kemet, we called it set. That was the human brain. Set was the archetype over material attachments. Your material attachments are stored in your flesh brain. Okay? Anything that you're attached to in this third dimension of reality is a blocking, is, or is a blockage to you getting back home. So I'm here to offend that energy that is blocking. And the only way it responds when it's affronted with truth is with fear, doubt, and outrage. I hope to be an outrage to your brain. Now, your mind, that's another thing. I think your mind will get with you. Your mind will get with you. But your brain won't. So that's just a little precursor. Okay, so <clears throat> speaking about the Catholic or the Catholic perspective, just to also elucidate, many of our original traditions have been invaded upon, and they've been invaded upon for many years. A lot of the books that we buy here, um, a lot of them are not even written by people who are in the tradition, but just have a lineage in the tradition. Like, oh, my grandfather was a Babala, my grandfather was a priest. He taught me things when I was a child, and I can write a book about it. But I'm a Muslim now, or I'm a Christian now. Okay, so a lot of times with the information we're getting, it has a taint of that of that invasion. Even the words that we use. For instance, in our in our Yoruba, uh, we have a word, and, and it's it's bok bok. Okay, if you were to hear it today, it's said like this bok bok. It means all. So if I say in our tradition, we call our ancestors et gum. So if I said if I was calling, I said bok bok gum. It doesn't really mean anything because Yoruba is very ton tonal. If I say book book egum, see what just happened? I saw the heads go like that. It has an energetic effect that's different. It's spelled G B O G B O. So whenever you see the G, it's a hard book. All right. So the tone interacts with nature in a certain way. Now, what happened when the early missionaries came into Yoruba land and they set up schools? They took out all of the hard consonants out of the Yoruba language. And when they were in school, not only would they teach English, but they would teach, they would reteach Yoruba, the proper way to speak Yoruba, which was taking out the hard consonants. But then when the children would go home, their grandparents and their parents would speak it in a traditional way, with all the tones. The tones have been removed. Okay? So this is a very small example, but when we say all, our idea and understanding of all is much different than the Catholic's idea and understanding of all. Because in truth, I don't have to say bok bok egun, bok bok orisha. As soon as I say the all, I'm speaking about us, I'm speaking about every object in this room, and I'm speaking about all of the unseen forces automatically. But you lose that, so now we have to say all the orisha, all the egun, and then we pour our, our, our libations. But we never did it like that. We just say bok bok. That's everybody. In Yoruba, another good, good example, we don't have a word for thing. There are no things in Yoruba, in the Yoruba vernacular. There are no things. The closest word we have to that is ohum. And ohum means two things. It means to listen, and it means force. A force. So in Yoruba land, there are no things, there are only forces. The chair is a force, the rug is a force, the lights are a force. Everything has, is, is an active principle. Nothing is um, dead, even though it may be inorganic, it's still animated, okay? And animated by a substance that we call ashe. Ashe uh, represents not only power, but spiritual authority. This is what Ashe is. It is power and spiritual authority. And all things are comprised of Ashe. Everything. Your shirt has Ashe. Your chair. Your pen you're writing on. The piece of paper you're writing on. It all is comprised of Ashe. In some systems they call this Prana. In other systems they call it Chi. In other systems they call it Moyo. In some systems they call it Life Force. Okay? It is the solidifying agent of the planet, what makes things real, what makes things happen, okay? 
So those are just some small examples. Um, and then as we go, we'll probably hit some more that will, for anyone else who may have, have wondered as well, we'll clear it up. But let's get back to our definition. So again, we're on the same sheet of music. Uh, orisha is broken up into two words. O-R-I-S-H-A, O-R-I-S-A. Only O-R-I-S-H-A because that is a wrong spelling. Why is O-R-I-S-H-A included in there? Because when the tradition was translated into English, they removed the accent marks. So it's really O-R-I-S-A with, an, with a dot underneath the S. Whenever you see the dot under an S, it becomes sh, not s. In English, English language, we use a lot of s when we talk. I've been noticing that the past couple of years. Uh, you know, I just did it the past couple of years. That's all we do, s, like snakes. S, 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 every other word. So, Orisha is actually spelled O-R-I-S-A. The problem that sometimes what, what occurs is that when we remove the spelling of things, we remove some of the understanding that we could actually have of those words because we're spelling in a way. Uh, if you go to Latin countries, you'll hear Orisha, Cha, or Chango, or Chum, Orisha, because they don't say sh in Latin countries. They say ch. Okay? Changing the spelling kind of messes us up a little bit. And I'll explain why. The word Orisha is comprised of two different words. Ori and Sha. Ori means head. But esoterically, Ori means consciousness. So it means your physical head, which we call the Ori Ode. The Ori itself is its own community. There are different aspects to the Ori, to the head. There's the Ori Ode, which is called the outer head. What that really is, is your brain. It's the Ori Inu, which is your consciousness. It's the Ori Ipako, which is at the back of your neck. That's your connection to your ancestors. It's your Ori Atari, which is at the top of your head here. That's your connection to your transcendental self. It's the Ori Iponri, which is your transcendental self, which we also call the doppelganger. If anyone's ever heard, or your spirit double, or your higher self. Then you have your Ori Iwaju, which we call your first eye, or something called the third eye, or the brow chakra. Okay? Um, so there are different components to the Ori itself. So Ori is, is the root word of the word Orisha. So the root of the Orisha is your consciousness. And then you have Sha. That's the last S name. Sha means to be selected or to be seated. Sha. So Orisha is either a selected head or a selected or seated consciousness. So the Orisha are actually different streams of cognition. Got it? Who's cognition though? Who's selecting the consciousness? You just named two different people. Okay. That's that's the beauty of the you're right. But that's the beauty of it. She said, your Godhead or your inner self. Our understanding, see, Africans, they itemize everything. Nothing is left unitemized. So the Godhead is one energy, the inner self is another energy, but they, they are comprised of the same community head, Ori. The Godhead is the Ori Ipuri. The inner self is the Ori Inu. But notice, Ori is still at the top. It's still Ori but they're aspects of the Ori, okay? So, in this sense, we understand that the Ori is the one selecting the consciousness for various purposes. So, it is important that we serve Orisha and that we give him praise and honor, correct? Right. Why would you serve something that is in your employ? Because of your belief, but not because of your knowing. You're absolutely right. Because you believe you should, because you were told that you're supposed to serve everything. Because you're nothing. 
this filthy rags, amazing grace, saved a wretch like you. The Orisha are here to serve you, not the other way around. I'll explain further. Okay. And remember, don't be afraid to raise those hands. It's okay. If I say anything that you can do that. It's all right. I won't, I won't be hurt. Okay. Now, we have a substance in our tradition called ME. And Yoruba E's are pronounced like E, like like you would say for egg. It's E. Okay? And I's are pronounced like E, like in feet. Alright? So, eh me is spelled E M I. Eh me. Eh me means breath. But more specifically, divine breath. Eh me is divine breath. Okay? Now, when we're dealing with the science of thought and the idea of eh me, uh, we have stories in our tradition. And I, that's not so much stories, it counts of how things happen. And our highest deity, well, our highest, most definable, our first defined deity is Olodumare. Okay, anybody ever heard that name before? Okay, the first defined de deity, the one. Olodumare is the one. Okay? But as a side note, what comes before the one? Zero. So that means Olo Dumari is not the highest. Olo Dumari is just the first attempt of the highest to define itself. <clears throat> Anybody in here familiar with Kabbalah? Okay, beautiful. So you know, uh, before Ketha, which is one, the crown, we have Ein. Ein Sof, Ein Sof Earth. Right? And those in that zero realm, but they're the undefinable, the causeless cause. Okay, and they give they give birth to the solidification of the one, which is Kether. Okay, and Kether is where everything begins. So for us here in our human thought and reality, everything begins with our supreme being, who we call Olu Dumari. But Olu Dumari is not the first or the supreme. Being. We'll understand it. So as we're moving forward, Olu Dumari breathes the breath of life into our head, into our ori. Now we saw the story somewhere before, right? Where? Hmm? The origin of life on earth. Right, but where, where did we, we saw it, we read it somewhere. The creation story. The creation, the Bible's creation, the, right. You know, um, God breathed breath into man and man became a living soul, right? Okay. It's true. It's true. Okay. Um, in our tradition, Olodumare breathed its breath, his breath more specifically, because Olodumare is a man. What came before Olodumare is not. Now I'm giving you the anthropomorphic version. But let's do it like this. Olodumare is positive force. What became before Olodumare was negative force. You got that? What is the purpose of positive and negative? Balance. Balance, yeah, exactly. What does the positive do? Uh, yeah. That's actually the best answer. Just be, I have to try to find it. Active. Action. Active. Good. Exactly. It's the one that goes out. Right. It expands. Mm -hmm. It's active. It's creative. It's action. It's seen. <clears throat> it's seen. Negative? Anyone? <laughs> you got a good answer, so I know it's right. What is it? <laughs> that was the opposite. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Help us out a little bit more. It is the opposite, but negative is contractive. Okay? It's dark. It's magnetic. Whereas positive is electric. The balance is electromagnetic energy, electromagnetism. That's the balance. Okay? Women are a negation. Men are an addition. Women are magnetic. Men are electric. Now, this is the important point. Because they're clearly not doing the same thing. But they're not opposites either. They're 
not the opposite sex. They're the complementary sex because they're working hand in hand. How are they working hand in hand? Anybody know how negative and positive work with one another? Okay. Um, let's look at a battery. Let's look at the construct of a battery. Okay. If you look at how a battery is designed, let's take a regular Duracell, right? On one part, you got the part where it says plus, and the other part, you got the part where it says minus, right? So we know we're talking about one part is positive and one part is negative. Okay? We got that, right? All of the power of the battery is held in negative current. Power is in negative current. The positive current doesn't have any power at all. Clear on this is very important. However, the positive current, the positive side of that battery, that pole, we usually have the, the lip going up, you know, you have the batteries like this, and then on top is that little thing. That's where the positive is. The positive side of the battery is what directs the current of the negative side. Without that positive pole, the negative has no direction. It's just a bunch of power. Ra unfurled itself from the darkness of our moon. Okay? So we always have these creation stories with light springing from darkness. But of course, we ignore the darkness because the darkness is evil. Right? That's what they told us. Yeah. So we gotta go. We gotta go with what they told us. We can't think for ourselves. <laughs> I mean, that's what they told us. They told us that Eve meant woman and El meant God. That's what they told us. Right. And then they told us who the first woman on the planet was. And they told us that that woman, not Eve, because we know there was other before that, the woman who made it. Woman who made love of Annie. Yeah. And Elohim. Elohim. Let us make man in our image, and the image creates them, male and female. Elohim translates to gods and goddesses. Those goddesses we know, but then the L on the back of us told us that they were gods. Evil. Are you comfortable with being evil? Are you comfortable with being evil? Nobody wants to be the black woman goddess. <laughs> it's more than the language, it's the culture. More than language. That word means that. But now we have to signify why in this culture, when I say this, Western culture, why is that evil? Why is that something to be afraid of? Why is that something to tell us to stay away from? Why would the black woman be evil? Why would she be something scary? Why did you hold her synonymous? I mean, evil is it's close to the word devil. Why would you make that word is so close? And why would that word mean this? And you know it meant it. But why would you say that that was something so horrible to stay away from? What if, to the individuals who created these terms and this understanding, what if she really was evil to them? Whatever your mother is, whatever whatever tool you come out of, that's what you are. Well, that's, just, that's your lineage. You know, but, I mean, it's still, it's still language because how many times have mothers told children that you like your no good daddy. Right. Does those that are ignorant mean, mothers, so but we can't we can't go by Were those people ignorant also who made that comment? Well that's what we're discussing. we're putting it out here so we can we we're deducing. But we, we don't want to compare it with a statement made out of just pure ignorance that we can clearly see put in front of us. That's an ignorant statement. But how do you know that, that was an ignorant statement? Well let's determine it. That's why I'm putting it out to us all. Mm -hmm. So we have that understanding, whatever you come out of is what you are. And we know on the continent, in our culture, we have matrilineal systems. And we understood that the mother held, or the woman held the bloodline. Okay? Not all over the country, we didn't all do the same thing. But that was an understanding that we had, and it was exclusive to us. Okay? That's one point. All right? just, just follow me for a second. And then you still at them and be like, oh, that's crazy. This right, this right here, right? Now, let's say that that young, I don't know, let's just call him a man. I don't know if it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a young boy, young girl being nursed there. But let's just say if it is a young boy, right? Now, this is no different than our picture of our, uh, our Set and Haru, or Isis and Horus, or something, right? Or of um, Yahshua and Mary, okay? And this signifies that... Uh, 
we had a we had an archetype in Kemet or Egypt named Oset. Okay? Oset means throne. Okay? All rulers must first sit on the throne of their mother. And this is how they are made into rulers. Okay? Just just from breastfeeding, you receive a fluid that teaches you how to socialize. It gives you your communal understanding. The col with colostrum. Okay? So let's 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 try something here for a second. Let's try something for a second. What if let's say that's again that's a little boy, that's a small boy. What if that boy didn't have that throne to sit on? What would happen to the boy? He would starve. He would starve. Oh, he would be given in modern times, given nourished, nourished by something else outside of that wasn't normal. Okay, yeah. he would be nursed outside of something that. Not, I won't say it's something that wasn't normal, but something that was not. Um, his normal. His normal, yeah. I'm looking. Right. He still would be starving. I would be too. <laughs> okay. Uh, we can look at the stories of Romulus and Remus. Anyone familiar with Romulus and Remus? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's why we got the, we got to turn it. Man, uh, dog is man's best friend. This was the founders of Rome. It was said that as children. They were raised by wolves, Romulus, and uh, he suckled from the teeth of wolves, and then he grew strong and came in and created Rome, as we know. So that's why dog is man's best friend. We don't have any stories like that about us feeding off a beast and then somehow becoming civilized with the whole mythology, walking out of the woods with the mythology after that and culture. We don't have those type of stories. But what we do understand is that all of our rulers sat on that throne. We always understood that. That's where our rulers sprang from. Okay? So now if we have that understanding, let's try it again. And I'll give you more examples. For people looking at those rulers, let's say that little boy right there is Shagat Zulu. Let's just say and let's say that him springing from that throne, from Orset, who in, in Yoruba culture we called Gemoja. Let's say because he was able to spring from that throne, he was able to become Shada Zulu, who handed the Europeans uh, second to Hannibal, the worst massacre that they've ever uh, reported in history, with spears and bare feet. What would you now consider that woman to be? The foundation, the beginning. The beginning of your end. Life. Life to your to your to your greatest adversary, to your to the most powerful man on the planet. She makes him just by having her, by, just by her her touch, by her presence, by her energy, by her ashe, by her ojiji. She creates great rules. She must be evil. She must be destroyed. She must be raped. And when our time is coming to the end, we must try to rebirth ourselves through her. Because if she has the keys to genetic survival, then all I have to do is miscegenate her and place my seeds inside of her if I'm an alien, and then I can survive like them. So, I'd say that definition was pretty on point. She's the black goddess, or black god, because god, god has no, no gender exclusivity, the term. A uh, uh, female can be god, a male can be god. Goddess is a fake word. Okay, so that black god is what gives birth to my destruction. She's scary. She's something I need to be afraid of. I'm going to actually create a whole mythology off of her, and I'm going to call it Medusa, so people stay away from her. I'm going to turn her locks into snakes. You see? I'm going to say that the moment she looks at you, you turn to stone. Why am I going to say that? Medusa. Because if something is turned to stone, that means it loses its ability to transform. 
you brought its genetic evolution to a halt. Because what you come out of is what you are. Now, I'm cool with her. I'm safe. I'm good. She only brings me to the next level. For others, she ends them. She stops them right there. As soon as you come out of that, you are no longer what you classified, what your father classified himself as. That's scary for some. Yeah. Olodumare. Anybody know what the word Olodumare means? What does his name mean? The one. No. <laughs> <laughs> you call him the one. It's okay. <laughs> it's all right. All right. I'm going to give you a quick little Yoruba uh, lesson for those. Some may not need it. But, uh, oh, whenever you see oh, two things in Yoruba, they always mean the same thing. O or O L. O L. O or O. Okay, it means either the spirit of or um, the owner of. Okay, it's not like English. English has no romantic subcontext. When you say something, it's there's no life to it. It just it's, it's created off of codes of numbers. You know, like if you say in English cat, it's just cat. If you say it in Spanish, it's el gato. El means what again? God. So as soon as you say El Gato, you're immediately deifying your cat. Because we understand that all things are a divine force. You see? Okay. So um, what about when we say the devil? Right. But what did we just do as soon as we said the devil? More than that. Deify the devil. Okay. We just made the devil a god. What? It's real easy. The devil made me do it. Every time, so yeah, every time we say the devil did or the devil, 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 if we say the devil, check this we out. The devil. I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you a little, uh, something to it. think about. If you said that man over there is the devil, right? Yeah. Then either you just deified a specific person or you just deified a specific group, which we tend to do. See, in our culture, we understand that because we have divine breath, I'll explain you how we got it, that whatever we speak to becomes an animated soul. That's why our words are so important. And you notice why I said, when we say that man, y'all know who I'm talking about. Y'all know the phrase. Yeah. <laughs> but why would I bring it into this beautiful gallery? That's the beauty of us. There's so much said that's not said. Okay? I don't know. I, I could just stand up here and y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, so that's how we deify things. The word the, remember, the, what, what is the study of religion or God? The theology. Theologian. The is the definitive article that adds the deity aspect to whatever you put after it. You gotta be careful. You see? Um, Allah. Al, El, or Er, all mean the same thing. They mean the, but more importantly, they mean God. In our context of what God is. Because God is such a very weak word, and I'll explain why later. But it means divine, divinity. If you feel like it. You can make anything your God if you feel like it. That's why God is such a weak word. God is just someone of influence. Or a force of influence. So when we deify a certain group of people constantly, what we're doing is making those people our gods of influence. Why you ain't got this? Because the unk is the devil. Why is this going on? Because the unk is the devil. So old means what again? The spirit. The spirit or the owner of. Okay? Old is very different. It's very similar to L. If you notice it. Okay? Odu means womb. Womb. So we really know the root of that word is not Odu. The root of it is actually Du. Du in Yoruba means black. Or sometimes, uh, you might even have it here, they have the soap, Du Du Oshun. That means, Du Du means black. So that Oshun means soap. Du Du Oshun is black soap. Okay. 
So Odu is the spirit of darkness, the spirit of blackness. And in our understanding in Yoruba, we associate that with the womb. So if you ask somebody, what does Odu mean? They'll say, oh, it means womb. But it actually means the spirit of blackness. Which is, again, the negative principle. And then we have, at the, at the tail end, we have Mare. Mare means serpent. So let's put it together. Olodu, Mare. Spirit of womb, serpent. Spirit of the serpent's womb. Olodu, Mare. Uh, Olodu, Mare is Atum, Mare. Atum, Mare. Okay? Now, Atum Mare, Atum is where we get what word? Um, Adam is man. And, and, but that's where Adam comes from, from Atom. Okay? So when we're dealing with Atom, we're dealing with atomic beginnings, right? Mare is serpent, but Atum Mare is atomic beginnings. Olo du Mare is the owner of the spirit of atomic beginnings. That's it. This is just the wisdom of our ancestors. I'm explaining you why the, it's the wisdom of our ancestors so you get it. Our ancestors knew that we were going to fall to such a state of dumbness that they anthropomorphized science. Everything that I'm teaching you this evening is actually children's stories. Just so you know, they're not really for adults. But we've fallen so far that we now have to take children's information to get back home. So a lot of times when people start talking about the Orisha or the Netrodo, they start speaking about them like they're superheroes. You know, or like they're cartoon characters. Okay? Because their understanding, they won't allow it to elevate to understand it. The Orisha, we're going to come to this, but the Orisha are cosmic formulas. They're formulas. That's why they'll say, oh, if you put Oshun and Oya together, they'll fight. Don't put them on the same shrine. That's not what that means. Oya is the energy of the supplanting of power. She moves power around. Oshun is the cognitive force of the universe. She's what we call dark matter. Okay, this goes much deeper than the cartoon. You know, it's science. See, mythology and your spirituality picks up where your science leaves off at. Okay, if you ever want to understand high science, high science is mythology. Okay, because science, science is all theoretical, it's all based on facts. Facts are just what everybody agrees to in the moment. Facts have nothing to do with truth or what actually works. It's just what we all agree on. Okay? Um, so when I teach Orisha, when I teach Ifa, when I teach African calculation, I'm teaching you the formulas of African thought. And then once you understand the formulas of African thought, then you can look at anything and say, that's ours too, because blah, 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 blah. You can break it down. Uh -huh. You see, if we keep it in that realm where we're dealing with the lower aspects and lower understandings of these Orisha, or just these energies, period, then we'll never be able to associate with any type of evolution. Why should we always associate with evolution? Because of Olo Dumari is the owner of the serpent's womb. I know, I'm going to explain why, what I mean by that. Okay. Mare means snake, Correct. And, and mythology, does anybody know what snakes represent? Um, rebirth. Yep. Regeneration. You got it. Yeah. Rebirth, regeneration. Okay. Of course, Kundalini. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in, in our Voodoo tradition, we have Dambala. Mm -hmm. Okay? And Dambala, again, represents not just its rebirth and, and regeneration, DNA. Mm -hmm. Double healings. Mm -hmm. Uh, now we use what's called the Caduceus staff. It's for us to understand it a little better. The staff in the middle is the spine, and then the snakes going up is us meeting with our, our twin halves at the top because they're facing each other. Okay? This is Mare. This is the serpent. This represents DNA. This represents evolution. This represents your next step. I'll explain why some more. But at any point, don't worry. If you need to check in. Okay, now we have Odu, which is womb, right? What on the planet and the cosmos or anywhere comes to being without coming through a womb? Nothing. No thing, right? You just said no thing. No thing comes to the planet without coming 
a womb of some sort, right? Some things come from the womb of your brain. Those are the problematic things in your life. Your mental projections. They didn't come from your soul. They didn't come from your spirit. They didn't come from your spiritual intellect. They came from your flesh, human brain. Okay? So everything comes out of a womb of some sort. The planet is sitting inside of a giant womb. Like you said, 87% of, of, of matter of, of what we're experiencing is dark energy. That's why when you start to understand African tradition, African thought and calculation, the first thing that you're going to figure out in a short time is that 95% of all this stuff is feminine. 95% of it is all feminine. Okay? Um, and 95% of what's here is masculine. James Brown told us it's a man's world. He was absolutely correct in that. This is a man's world. Men are better acclimated to the planet Earth. That is our job, to acclimate our families to the planet. Women are better acclimated to heaven. You got that? It is their job to acclimate us to spirituality. See that? Because after he finishes with her, he has to start at heaven. Because all things come from the unseen to the seen. Then after he starts with her, then he goes to his father and he learns about politics and social construct. Because she, she's not good at that. That's not her world. Her world is the unseen world that controls all of the seen world. Right, got that? Okay. You may agree, you may disagree, but you know, as long as you get where I'm coming from, okay, then you can process it in your own. Uh, so, Olu Dumare represents that next step, that next child that comes out the womb. The next child that comes out the womb is the next step in evolution. The next climb of Kundalini. The next evolution of DNA. The next step is Olodumare. The Atumare, the atomic beginnings. And the Yoruba tradition and culture, that is the, the top. Okay? That is the first definable archetype or entity. It's Olodumare. And then things come down from there. The next step after Olodumare is Ori. Ori means what again? Head. Head or consciousness. consciousness. Okay. Same thing. Either one. If you if you look at if you look into Yoruba, it will just say head. Because again, even the language has been infiltrated. So much of the divine meanings and things has been extracted. So they say Ori. Ori is just head. But what does Olodumare mean? It means God, God the Father. They tell you that Olu Dumari means God. No. God is whatever. My shirt could be God today. Whatever I feel like serving and letting influence me, that's God. God didn't make you. You made God. You know when you first made God? I love that these pictures here because I'm just, I took the election. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was divinely timed. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> because you lost her. You lost her. You had someone that whenever you would cry out or call, she would show up. She cared about your every need. You see? She would hold you into the dawning light. Okay? We just take all of the Pentecostal songs and just apply it. <laughs> Mama's on the main line. Main line. Tell her what you want. You know? Apply it there, because that's what it was. And then what happened is we lost her, and then we became very lonely. And we said, "I I have this paradigm of something always caring and serving serving my needs. There has to be something else that is caring for me and servicing my needs. There has to be. So I must create a God, and I will convince myself that that God is actually caring for me." servicing my every need. Regardless of how my community looks, regardless of how my life looks, I know God loves me. See, you understand? Mm -hmm. That's why Ola Dumari is not God. God is so small. God is created for our, because of our need, because of our deficit model that we travel through the world. Okay, because most of us didn't get enough of that. We got off of that rest a year old, 
We should have been on until we were about six or seven years old. My dad was over there. But this society, we're told there's something wrong with that. You know, so now I got, but, but we got God. Don't, you don't need your mother anymore. We're going to give you Jesus. We're going to take the woman out. We're going to give you a guy. You see? So, Olo Dumari, the owner of the serpent's womb, he did what? Uh, he breathed, breathed the breath of life into each Ori, Emmy, animating it, making it a living soul. Okay? And that is what we possess, Ori. We got that part. So, the next step from Olo Dumari. It's Ori. But I will give you uh, an understanding. Uh, there are also emanations of Olum, Oludumari. An emanation is a direct expression. Okay? Kind of like my fingers emanate from my body. They're on my body, but you may not be able to understand the fullness of who and what I am, but you could probably understand these three fingers. Okay? Now, those three fingers were Orumila, Obatala, and Oduruwa. Orumila, okay. Obatala, and Oduruwa. We haven't gotten to Orisha yet. We haven't gotten to Orisha. So what am I saying? Orumila, Obatala, anyone who's familiar with the tradition, and Oduruwa are not Orisha. As is so commonly taught. It's so commonly taught because no one ever decided to research to find out if that was true. Because people, when they think of Yoruba culture, they only think that Three things exist, Oludumari, the Orisha, and the ancestors. And that's, that's the end of it. And that's not true. There are more entities at play here, at work. Orumila is, a, is the spirit of omniscience, all-knowing. In Kemet or Egypt, we knew him as Tehuti. Okay? In uh, the Bible, we knew him as Moses. In hip-hop, we knew him as Chuck D. Serious? Mm -hmm. Why can't they be here today? Mm -hmm. You know? I'm serious. Well, you could go home and read some more Chuck D. You should. <laughs> you should. See, he brought the tablets down to us. We also, before Chuck D, we knew him as Dr. Ben. See. He came in. Hmm? Dr. Ben. Yeah. That's Moses. That's, that's Tehuti. That's Arumina. These spirits and energies represent bringers of the law. Okay? You know how many of us didn't even know we built pyramids before Dr. Ben? We still had that Charlton Heston thing in our head. And that, um, what's that, what's that wicker one? Who practiced wicker? Liz, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Taylor. Yeah, witch. So we, that's what we had. And Dr. Ben said, oh, wait a minute. Look, look, look at these images. See, he brought the law. Okay? Those are bringers of the law. And they come in certain generations. Okay? I'll give you a, bit, a more understanding so you have more examples. Um, and then you had uh, Oduruwa. This is why I said it's very close. In the name Oduruwa, what do we have? We can already start breaking some Odu. of this stuff down. Odu, meaning. Uh, the, the, the womb you of a woman. You got it. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it does, but just womb, womb right? It doesn't womb. But yeah. you didn't, you didn't t said the rest of the definition without realizing. Womb of some certain. No, you gave us you oh. gave us more. You gave okay. us all of it. You could. She said it means the womb of the woman. Right. That's actually what the full name of Oduwa means. So that's what I said. You, you got it. Remember, what does do mean? It means black. Wa means woman. So Oduduwa, ready for it? Drum roll. Mm -hmm. O is spirit. Du is black. Wa is woman. Oduduwa is the spirit of the black woman. I'm not making this up because I want us to feel good about ourselves. I'm telling you exactly. I'm just giving you a language lesson. We ain't even got to the spiritual part yet. For you to have an understanding of the Yoruba thought. Oduduwa means the spirit of the black woman. And Oduduwa represents the power of the energy of omnipotency. Oduduwa is omnipotency, all powerful. Okay? 
and then we have another emanation. Remember, we still ain't got to Arisha yet. Obatala. Oba means chief or ruler. Tala means white cloth. Obatala is the ruler or the chief of the white cloth. Talking about string theory. But Obatala is, is, is the energy of, of omnipresence. Because what is that cloth? It's the fabric of all existence that holds everything together. Scientists have now been delving into this idea of super string theory. And it's saying that instead of everything being made of particles, because before that we basically had Einstein, well not we, they, had uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. And that really dealt with particle theory. Okay. Everything is comprised of particles. And now they have this theory that they are not able to figure it out, though. So a lot of the scientific community is being laughed at for this. Because you can't figure stuff out if it was never meant for you to be there. Some places are just not meant for some people to go. They don't have the, the, the force in their nervous system to understand that information. They go crazy. Super string theory deals with everything is not made of particles, but in fact are made of strings that are vibrating at different resonance. And this different vibration and different resonance is what creates all of matter. So matter is created technically by sound. That's a little closer to our understanding. One of the problems with that understanding is that it separates the relationship in the community of all these spirits with one. For instance, it's like when you eat food, right? We're told that food is fuel for the body. So if you want certain things to happen in your body, you eat certain foods, right? But that goes along with the supposition that the body is nothing but a machine. So how crazy is that? They say. So if I want to run fast, I'm eat some oranges. You know? But do I have a spiritual relationship and connection to that orange, knowing that it is not a thing? But in fact, in our European tradition, it tells us it is a force. So that means it's, a, it's alive, it's a spirit. How does that spirit feel about me? You see? So they tend to compartmentalize things and separate. You see? They don't work in groups, they don't work in a communal, cyclical, holistic theory and mindset. Everything is separated and fragmented. That's why they will never understand string theory, because they will never bring themselves to understand ocean can't understand string theory without understanding dark matter. It won't work. The Orisha are formulas. But that also has another implication that some may be ready for and some may not be ready for. That means they're indifferent. They are without feeling. Feeling are part of having chakras. They may live in certain chakra houses but they don't have feelings like you have. They are indifferent. So when you are going through something and you're saying, I know the Arisha got my back, you are wrong. That is a product of your religious programming. And because again, you got pulled away from her too soon. So now you're looking for something to take care of. They don't do that. In fact, the Orisha are more closely associated with our understanding of genie and jinn. When you polish the lamp, the lamp of God, this is the lamp of God, also known as Solomon, Sol Oman, son of man. This is your son. How do we know this is your son? Because they told us. They, who was they? Right? They told us that the son of man was the one who performed the, the miracles. It was actually Yahshua who said it. When he performed miracles, who should we say did this? Tell them the son of man. But we didn't think anything about it. Because, okay, that just sounds like he was being humble, right? The son of man. We didn't think that he was talking about the lamp of God. Or that when we read stories about Solomon, and we understood that Solomon means son of man, that they were actually the same individual. Which means that neither one of them existed. It was just some information for you to become the Christ. But again, remember what the Catholics taught us? You ain't nothing. You got to serve everything outside of you. Right. This is the Son of Man. 
The Son of Man will do what one day? He'll return, right? And he's going to come through the clouds. That's what it said. And oh my God, right. I'm talking about the Bible now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blast me. <laughs> they come through the clouds and everyone will see him. Every eye shall see him. So don't go in that bathroom. Don't go in that shrine in your basement. Don't go to the moon because you're going to miss the rapture when you're caught up in the moon. You're going to miss it. That makes sense, right? Did you want to have the question yeah. go on? You definitely not supposed to question that. You gotta have faith. You gotta have faith. Right. Right. Faith is the belief in the unseen. Mm -hmm. Uh (laughs) (laughs) Faith is what you rely on when you don't have evidence or proof. Faith is this. Faith is what keeps you dumb. Faith is what keeps you powerful. But you know. It just you just gotta change the sound of something a little bit, a change a word, and it, it'll jack you up. If I say it's, it's the belief in the unseen, I just made you all dumb. If I if I say it's the knowing of the unseen, I brought you back to her. Right. Faith has nothing to do with belief. They're two different things. Okay, faith is a knowing. 97% of creation you cannot even see. This room is filled with more stuff you can't see than you can see. We only got stuff up to about here. The rest of it is air. We can't see none of that. And it, it is more air in here than there is objects. But we can't see. In our traditions, we call that Oduduwa. And we also call it in our other tradition, Amun. Then it got hijacked into Amen. After you say a prayer, I don't I haven't seen this thing happen yet. When I pray to you, the word pray means to beg, by the way. That's why I don't pray. So after I pray to you, I haven't seen it happen, but I have faith that it will happen. But in order to seal it, I use the ancient word of Amen. Which means I know it's going to happen. Not I believe it. See, I tell you, you just got to change one little word in there. <laughs> That's why we're talking about formulas. This bastard, evil, wicked language you were given is nothing but a formula. Formula to keep you earthbound. Okay, okay. here's the number one thing. Is there herb or what? Yes, sir. First problem is this. If I tell you that, now it's religiousized. Yes, sir. Because what I would feed and what you would feed Yes, sir. Because we're dealing with different aspects of the Almighty. Okay, understanding that we're dealing with aspects of different aspects of the Almighty. My food is not your food. Yes, sir. You see, I can listen to Earth, Wind, and Fire in the dark, and I'm good to go. I don't even have to eat the next day. Yes, sir. I'm straight. Serpentine, fire, you know, Brazilian rhyme. I live a story. Oh, yes, sir. I'm good. Because it's recharging my OGG, or what you call the auric body, and I just feed off of myself. Because the charge is so great. That may not be. I mean, everybody else might just fall asleep at the end of it. it. May not do anything for them. Some of the sisters might say, "Hey, well, I'm gonna, I, I, I'm gonna go to water, and I got these crystals, and I'm just gonna sit and meditate in the water with these crystals, and bring in energy from that form." See, when we're dealing with our understanding, we, we, we have this understanding that we can transubstantiate anything. Anything. I'm messing around. You know, much energy is just right here. How many people have stood here and looked? Oh, wow, that's deep. This energy here, people who wrote these books. My job of, of a priest is to figure out how to get it out of it. You see? So, um, and I don't mean to not answer the question, but the, the, the answer is varied. You see? Um, like you said, someone took our stuff and put their twist on it. But that also means the food is different now. Their food is not our food. I mean, we process food differently. We, we can process more food sources differently without things having to go in our mouth, you know. And our drive, our, our reason is different. We don't have tel- a telomere deficiency or shrinkage is not our crisis because of one thing, Oduduwa. Oduduwa is neuromelanin, okay? That understanding that you're speaking of is speaking of what's needed in order to function in this world. 
we don't have that issue. Okay? Uh, there are people who will take your blood, specifically your blood, in any form they can get it, any fluid. There's blood in urine. There's blood in your semen. Okay? And they will use that in order to continue to manifest and survive on the planet. Okay? Um, in comedic structure, we had an entity we know as, we knew as Kansu. Okay? Now, Su, in Yoruba structure, means moon. Or it also means uh, the menses. And it also means the source. Okay? We call the moon Osu. Okay? And then we have an archetype known as Oshun. Spelled O-S-U-N. She has a reading or a sign that goes with her, which is named Irosun, which means Oshun sings, or Oshun returns to the source of things. And it also speaks about the menses. Okay? So now let's go back to Kansu for me. Kansu was known as the night traveler. Why was he the night traveler? Because he was associated with the moon. We're talking Egypt. So I'm going by Pokemon. Kim and Good. All right. So Kansu was known as the night traveler. Kansu, we know, is an earlier form of Heru. Or some may know it's Horus. Or some may know it's Yashua or Shango you know, or uh, Thor. But either way, Kansu was an earlier form. And he was called the night traveler. And from the study of Kansu, uh, there was a theory that was come up, came up with and was called the Draconis theory, which later became the Draconis string, which later became Dracula, which later became, or previous to that, became Dragonis. Okay? This all comes from a study of Kansu and how Kansu would travel and be active at night. I'm explain what this is. Kansu is nothing but melanin. Okay. Melanin is active at night. This is why I said I will play Earth, Wind, and Fire with the lights on at night. Because that feeds my melanin. That's one of my melanin. See, we think melanin is active in the daytime. It's not. Serotonin is active when you make it in the daytime. And in fact, too much sun can dry out your pineal organ. It's not a gland. It's a gland for people who are unable to use it. Then it just secretes a little bit proper sleep and also dark, complete darkness. A lot of times we have like uh, you know our little gadgets and stuff in the room, alarm clocks, and they got the lights blinking. You know, that actually disturbs your melanin productivity. So it should be actually pitch darkness. And it's not just enough to put a mask on, you know, because it's we, we absorb and process melanin through what we call our epidermal melanin. So it has to be dark enough. See, one of the challenges and the problems with African tradition is this. When did the tradition begin? At what moment in time are we calling it tradition? Throw some numbers out there. I'm cool with it. Well, well, yeah, I'm, well, you know it's a statement. It's, it's a set of question. <laughs> So the challenge there is that we have made our African entity a static occurrence, a static phenomenon. You know, like it did not evolve. Our understanding of again Oludumare, Atumare, our atomic beginnings, it is evolution. So that means God is even changing, quote unquote. I'm using it parenthetically. Our, our supreme being is not the same. It's not like the Bible was saying yesterday, today, and today. No, it's not the same, because you ain't the same. Every time Oludumari comes back to the planet, what does Oludumari come as? As what? A baby. A baby. Oludumari is just a big baby. That's it. The only thing that's old here is you. You the only thing aging in the cosmos. Everything else, is, 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 we're talking about children. That's why whenever Oludumari returns to the planet, it says, because it hasn't lost its wonder. You see? But as we get older, we develop this horrible thing that we call a personality. And our personality concretes and cements us into a way of being. 
and it's, there's layers to it. Layers of ego, layers of personality, and this is what makes you old. Old people and babies don't have as much of it. That's why old people, they always are giving you all kind of wisdom. Because they're getting ready to go back to the essence. But also, they just don't care anymore. That's the highest state of being. I don't care. It's the hardest state of being. I don't care. Boy, uh, Michael Brown just got shot. Killed. How you feel about it? You say, no, you can't. You can't. Even in your questions. <laughs> Why am I supposed to care about something that every book I've read from our scholars and from our deep thinkers has told us that we're living in a holographic universe? None of this is real. So why am I supposed to care about that? What makes me care? What is caring? Is it emotion? It's, 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 it's an emotion, right? It's an emotional attachment. What it, where attachment is born from? I told you earlier. The brain. Not the mind. The flesh brain. Let's try a couple of things here. I don't know him. I don't know him. This is... We probably have another one happen today. It's always happening. Why am I supposed to care about that incident? Do you not care about the incident or do you not care about my clients? Both. Why should I care about it? See, I need to understand why I should. Mm -hmm. What is the imperative and the charge that's telling me I'm supposed because to care about my clients? Any emotional attachment to it. No, but why, why is somebody, not that you're saying, telling me I should care? Well, why I care is similar to the example you gave with this um, shelf right here with your reaching objects and all that because a lot of energy goes into certain things. Mm -hmm. You know, if a young you know, a young person gets killed and how people experience that and also how people process that. Right. What people do with that information. Mm -hmm. So that's why I care. Okay. That's cool. You want to know why? Because that's why you care. But that doesn't compel me to have to care. That's the problem here. That's a, see, we come out of the churches and we come out of the mosques and we say we're not religious anymore. But we, we carry that mindset with us. So you say this to me and now I'm supposed to have an emotional attachment to something I'm not attached to. He died for your sins, for you. I'm supposed to feel, but I'm supposed to feel something, but I don't feel anything. That's not fair. You have an attachment, you have a feeling. Okay, cool. I got a feeling about others. I'm still messed up over Bobby Womack. To be honest with you, I'm keeping it real. I, we're afraid sometimes because of our religious understandings and our religious connections to life to say these type of things or to express that, hey, this is where I'm at with it. But at the end of the day, no matter where you're at with it, it really doesn't matter anyway because none of this exists. So you can choose to feel however you want about it. That's fine. You don't have to feel a certain way for your salvation. You know, I'm, I may like, you know, kale, but I don't like arugula. It doesn't really matter either way because what I'm eating is not what I think I'm eating anyway. So it doesn't matter. But I do have a, a corruptive side to me. My corruption is my humanity. The fact that you care is your corruption. That is the corruption of humanity. Whether you were happy about something or whether you were sad about something marks your corruption because that's where you become human. That's where your emotions take over. You're not indifferent. You're not sitting in the middle. And I'm not saying that because you're not doing that something's wrong with you. That is the trap of humanity. There are some things you're gonna, your spirit is going to stretch to and some things it's not going to stretch to. But I want you to understand something. We spoke about Kansu, we spoke about Dracula, we spoke about the Draconis stage, right? What is Dracula always after? Blood. Blood, right? Because within the blood is life, correct? All right, but more importantly, within the blood is mountain. When you read a lot of books on astral travel, one of the first things they tell you to do is get yourself an astral mate or astral companion. 
Okay, they say if you go into certain realms, you could you could ask an animal spirit to accompany you or a spirit in that realm to accompany you. And Kansu, the night traveler, relates itself to melanin. Why would I need an astral mate when I already have a built-in night traveler? The night represents the astral realm. If I don't have a built-in astral traveler or night traveler, then I have to ask someone to take me to those places that I don't belong. Because I might get hurt when I get there because I don't belong there. There was a time, I remember not too long ago, where certain people couldn't walk through our neighborhoods. Somebody would have to run, well, I mean, all of them, run down the stoop and say, no, 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 he with me, he with me, he with me, he with me. Put that away. He with me. Come on, come on, come on. Go inside. Now, they, people can just walk wherever they want. You know. But when you have a built-in Kansu, moon energy, night traveler, draconis, dragon, you don't need an astral moon. One of my initiatives has to be, if I don't have that, I have to join with somebody who does, however I can. Whether I may invite them into my coven, I may invite them into my bed. I need to get some of that melanin, because I'm Dracula. And melanin allows me to do this. Melanin is the matter of crazy. It creates sanity. It creates anything. So we, we pride ourselves in it. But melanin is our biggest challenge. Because whatever we put into it, like the darkness of the womb, it becomes. That's why we have to be conscious creators. But if I need to get a hold of some melanin, right? It's more so because I'm trying to materialize on a place that I don't belong. If I do not have a soul, if I do not have an aurea, if I do not have the breath of Olodumari, then that means my presence here, I did not come through a womb. We spoke about this earlier. Remember I said, some things come through the womb of the mind. Right. That's what he wanted you to think. Yeah. First of all, he wasn't even on the womb. They don't already proved that. He was in the studio. Mm -hmm. But aside from that, what he was saying is that man has already been here. Mankind, which is actually not man, has never been off the planet. Man. Mem auf nun. Mem auf nun, that's where we get the word man. Mem means means woman. Auf means man. Nun means child. So when we say man, we're speaking about the divine trinity. That is man. Man's already been here because man ain't from the planet. Man is from the planet. The Smurfs. We had Smurf, the Smurfs, Pop Smurf. Such a smurf and all that. We have smurf et. Et is a smaller version of something that's larger. You got that? Et is the small version of something that's larger. We live on the plan et. Man is from the plan. Mankind, the thought projection from your physical mind, is from the plan et. You are on the plan at in order to learn stuff. This ain't nothing but a gigantic classroom. So this was a small step for man because man already did it. But for mankind like me, who is not really that was not really born of woman in a natural way, this is a huge step. We're still talking about Kansu and Dracula and Mensis and Michael Brown. So we have this soulless individual that we decided to create. And the reason it was soulless because it never received the direct breath of Polo Damari into the, into the Ori, making it a real soul. Because the only things that are real on the planet are things that possess a soul. Anything else that is just a spirit is not real. The projections from different places, and at some point they will end. That goes for your angels and Orishas and Naturu and the Wild and the Kisi and the Lotis and the Goon and all the rest of them. They're not real. The only thing that is real are the things that are permanent. And that is your soul. Your soul is infinite and your soul is devoid. 
could you just talk a little bit more about that? Because what, what you're saying is you, what you're trying to say. <laughs> no, it tell me what's real and what's not real. And so, in order for me to believe that, I need a little bit more. I don't want you to believe it. If you believe it, then I again politicize you. Don't believe anything I'm saying. Either you know it or you don't. We're not in this age anymore. That was the thinker. That's over with. We're not thinking anymore. Now we're knowing. Either we're tapping into the energy of our soul and we're knowing, or we ain't. You heard children say that. I didn't know how to do that, sweetheart. I just know. You don't argue with it. Okay, I guess you do. Because why? Because that is Moto Dumare showing you I'm the I'm the next stage in evolution. The next stage is to know. Not the believer. Not the thing. Because Jesus has returned. What are you laughing? You don't believe in Jesus? <laughs> what, what do you mean by that? By what point? Jesus has returned. Jesus was called, well, his name was not Jesus. We know that part. Yahshua was called the Son of Man. Right? This is the Son of Man, which we also know to be Solomon. Okay? When the Son of Man comes through the clouds, all will see him. How is that possible? Third eye is going to be open. Gonna be open. Mm-hmm. But what's the clouds? Because you can't see the sun when, when it's behind the clouds, right? Mm-hmm. What are the clouds? The illusion. illusion created by what? Mm-hmm. Anybody ever seen a, a diagram or an image of an actual brain? Brain. Mm-hmm. Notice it looks like clouds. Anybody ever seen a pineal organ? It looks like a sun. What clouds your ability to function strictly from your first eye reality? Your brain. Your thinking. Because I don't want you thinking. Just come right. Just we can connect right here. Right here, we, we all know the same stuff. Because we all have the breath of life. Right here, from here. This is the rapture. When this comes online, that's when a new or new world order just started. That's the new world order. Not when some external alien culture tells you. Yeah, now you're going to put a clock on my, my evolution. Oh yeah, you know, such and such. And they start, that's when the new world order is going to start taking over. Man, the new world order is when this thing comes online. Right. Now it's a new world. You see? So that's why the son of man or Solomon is here. It was said that Solomon trapped the jinn in his ring using the star of Dawood. We know that's the star of David. That was the seal. It was an iron ring. And he trapped the genie inside of it. Okay? The genie or what? The genie is, is smokeless fire. Okay? The sun is what? Smokeless fire. The, the seal of Dawood or the star of David, pyramid this way, pyramid that way, as above, so below. Correct? Mm-hmm. So once you connect with your higher self and you're reflecting that light, that image, then you are able to release or control, because now they're at his beckoning, you're able to control the jinn. You are now functioning as the son of man. So now, we have these individuals who are soulless, they're mankind. They, they are created from and for the planet. This is their home. It's not your home. It's their home. How do we know it's their home? Because look how they fight to maintain it and keep it from you. Because it's all we got. It's not fair. You get this and you get that. We just got this. So we're going to do whatever we can to subjugate you and keep, keep what we got and scrape up all the resources that are on it. Meanwhile, Big Mama's in the kitchen cooking, singing that this world is not my home. And by and by, I'll go back home to my sweet Lord. Even Big Mama knew she wasn't from here. With all that Jesus, she still knew this was not my home. In all our traditions, our home is never here. Kwa Zulu. Zulu means people from Mars. That's what the name means, the people from Mars. You know the Dogon story. Where 
you're never here when we start. Now let's go to Nordic tradition. They got Asgard. Okay? They got Asgard, which was a later addition to their tradition. Originally, they had the same Valhalla existence. But Valhalla and Olympus, these were not places that were off the planet. They were only on the highest mountains. This is where, the, this is where their gods are from. So one thing you'll notice is that when you're looking at the mothers of European culture, ideology, and thought, there's always an origination on the planet, just someplace real high up that's hard to get to, but you can get to it. Our stuff we can't get to as long as we're functioning from the clouds. We can't get there. As long as we're functioning from the lower now, we can't get there. Now, individuals born of this planet were born through thought projection Whatever you come to from is what you need to survive. Clear? If you come from the planet, you need to eat things that come from the planet in order for you to live. Real simple. But there are different components and aspects of to whom what you are. This is the African thought and calculation. So whatever your soul comes from, it needs that to survive. That's one of the reasons why we're hyper-religious. Because we need God so much. Sometimes we just drug. We get high all the time. That's to try to feed our soul. Because we're trying to get back to that place. To keep the soul buoyant. Whatever the spirit comes from. It needs that to survive. If something came from your mind. What does it need to survive? Attention. Attention. Focus. Focus. So we have a bunch of meetings like this. Right? Everybody's learning something. And the reason I, I know you're learning is because everybody right now looks like they're meditating. You're not thinking right now. I can tell. I can feel it. The only time you can learn something is when you stop thinking. When somebody's really giving you some, te some teaching and they get quiet and you're just taking it in and you're not... And for a moment, if you, if you check yourself, you'll be like, wait a minute, how much time just passed? You'll be looking at your watch. Because you didn't realize you was actually meditating. Your brain stopped working. Because I'm talking on various levels. It's the words, but it's something else going on, too. So, if the thought projections need my attention to survive and to live, and those thought projections study me better than I study myself, then they just have to do something to get my attention. Let's have a good meeting. Let's get together, you know, and let's talk about to each other. Yeah, how's it in, in, in Louisiana? I'll tell you what it's like in New York. And let's connect on that level. And crack jokes, high fives, and start talking real loud and all of that. And what do they do? They're going to go kill one of our children. So we can all go. The unk man is the devil. Told you look. And he says, thank you, because... The idea and the notion of the devil is so much older than I am. So you just put me in antiquity by saying a statement like that. And you deified me by saying the devil. You won't even say the person who shot him is a devil or just a bad person. You won't even mention his name. You're going to deify his whole ethnic group because of what he did. You're going to give his entire ethnic group your mental focus and attention because of what one of them did. Consequently, making them more real. So, I don't care. For that reason. And I work hard not to care. Because I'm not giving you my God self. You ain't getting it. Mm -mm. You're not even real. This is Nightmare on Elm Street, the first one, at the end. How did they kill Freddy? She turned her back on him, and she just said, you're not real. You're not real. I'm dreaming. I'm dreaming. Yeah, they were breaking down some science in that movie. And he was behind her with the claws out. Look at me. Look at me. She wouldn't turn around. You're not real. I'm dreaming. I'm dreaming. I'm dreaming. <laughs> you're dreaming. They're not real. 
So they do things like that so you will say that they are real. They don't care what kind of attention you give them. You ain't got to love them. Just give me some attention. I'm starving here. So when they talk to you, get all of them. And then they want to start touching you and all that stuff. Get off my aura. I know what you, you feed it. You're parasitical. You're vampirical. You're feeding on me. I feel it because now I'm hungry. Talk to you for five minutes. I want to go lay down. I'm hungry and I want to go have sex. I need energy. Somebody done took all my energy. You're supposed to get energy from your sex. You're supposed to get energy from your food. We tend not to. So Michael Brown, you know, I ain't thinking about it. Just ain't thinking about it. I'm going to keep on using Bobby Womack because music and light, sound and light programs my DNA. I need that. That, that makes the snake go up. That brings the kundalini energy. Okay? That makes Sean go arise. So that's why I probably care more about Bobby. <laughs> they put the word, they put it there for you to understand it. But we skip past it. Because we keep talking about their agenda and what they're doing. And we can't even, even identify they. Who? Which one? Because then, then you wouldn't deify me. You would go after the one. And I'm going to show you how most of y'all don't care. I done said a couple of things tonight that you laughed at. How could you be up in here laughing at somebody who's just killed? That you care so much about. And all of you laughed at certain points that you're all guilty. Because it's hard for you to admit that you don't care that much either. I'm not indicting anyone. I'm indicting everyone. You don't care that much. Make some eye contact. Make sure y'all know what I'm talking about. And you shouldn't care that much. And when you learn to turn your back on the beast, Olo Dumare says, I'm not going to recreate you. You will die out in this generation. Because all through antiquity, you've only stayed alive because of some happy go lucky African. Every time you use somewhere, you're getting ready to end, naturally, from your own debauchery. And then here comes some happy-go-lucky African coming and resuscitating you, teaching you how to plant corn, giving you essential oils, giving you wicker, giving you chess, setting up music conservatories, and giving you music to align your chakras, and even giving you phrases like, music soothes the savage beast. What beast do you think that the Moors were talking about when they said that? Why did they set up, they didn't call them music conservatories, they called them healing conservatories. And they would come in there and they would play the lute and the lyre and realign their chakras. Because you want to keep giving them attention. I'm not giving them attention. Nope. Ain't happening. Now, it's a struggle. Because that's the highest level of being. It's hard. It really is. You know, I'm driving through here. I'm saying, man, look at this. Look at that. Look at that. I know who the source of the issue is. I know. But there's a balance between my humanity and my divinity. And I'm trying to get my divinity to win out. And in order to get my divinity to win out, i got to move beyond my corruption. And my corruption is how I feel about a third dimensional reality that doesn't even exist. How I feel about it. I'm trapped in my dreams. How do you trap a God? You make it human. That's the only way you can trap a God. It's by making it human. Because eventually what happens is this is an amazing process. God forgets that it's God. Because Odumari begins to age. And it says, I'm not the baby anymore. I'm the Cancer. I'm the Libra. I'm the Leo. I'm the African. I'm the identity. I'm the id. I'm not Olu Dumar. I did not come here to answer my own question. 
I did not come here as a negation of myself to look at myself and say, oh, that's what you look like when you're mad. Because as old Damari, I've never been mad. I don't have feelings to be mad. Because I'm indifferent. So I came here to have experiences happen to me and to go through situations so I can feel that corruption of my chakra. And then what I can do is after I feel that and experience that corruption, I can then bring that information back to heaven. We call it Orun. And I can evolve myself. But let's just say, for, for, for hypothetical reasons, or for this conversation, that we can, someone can master something and be the best, not only master it, but be the best in the plan, on the planet at it. Let's say if you two could be the best artist Perfected artists. You can be no better. Let's try that for a second. I know. It's a I just said hypothetically. Come on now. Take a problem with me. <laughs> hypothetically, you are, you are perfect. How can you become better? If you, you're already perfect now, but how can I make you better? It's, it's at its top. It's totally stressed out. Can't, can't go no further. It's the best that it could ever be on the planet. You are the best. Hmm? Make it a who? Destroy to make you the She already is. Okay. How about I tie your hands behind your back? And then say, now. Your teeth, right? <laughs> you would. Yeah, paint brush your teeth. Yeah. You would. Can you paint with your teeth as well as you can with your hands? Over time, you learn. Over time, you learn. Yeah, you would learn, but not initially. Not initially. Initially, you you would feel the weight of that handicap. But you know you have to handicap yourself to become better. You are an artist who paints with your hands. That is the identity. But did they say that earlier? They said that they were artists. They didn't say that necessarily. But now we get into semantics. Let's assume that they, because we ought to, we also can't say that they're the best because there's no such thing. So we're just saying, we're using that as an example. They are artists, because an artist can, is going to paint with anything. They know that they have to. We know that. That's an important point. So say you're right, I know where you're going, but an artist or a soul is always going to push to express. It just finds different vehicles to express itself through. Now, but the identity we have is painting with our hands. That's our perfected state. So I handicap that state, that identity. And now what did I just do? You said it earlier. On the typing. On the oh, you killed it. I killed it. I killed that identity. I killed. I know you as an artist doing this. That's dead, gone. And now you got to be re re reborn. But you're still an artist. But you got to be reborn as the artist now who paints with whatever teeth, you know, whatever you're gonna do with tone. You're gonna be reborn as that. But you have less to work with. You. That's the handicap. You got less. But you got to have less in order to get more. <laughs> That's why we are all a negation of the Most High, of Holy Demari, of God. God negated itself. Because if something is totally stretched out to perfection, if it's totally stretched out to perfection, that means it cannot, it's dead. It's not moving. It's not growing. In order for it to grow, my, let's say this is a perfected state. I'm totally stressed out my arm. In order to be better, I got to pull back a little. I got to take some away from myself. From this perspective, now I can learn something about myself. Because when I'm totally stressed out, stretched out, I can't. I don't know anything. I can't even see the tip of my fingers. That means I don't even know how smart I am. You didn't know how much of an artist you were until I handicapped you. You 
thought the art was in your hands. Now you realize, oh no, I am the art. I don't even have to touch a canvas. I'm an art, just, just the way I speak is the art. Or let's use another word, the divine. I don't have to show you the divine. I be the divine. Not I do the divine. Okay? So, I have to become a negation of myself. And then once I do that, that negation means I now, my negation, what we put on is not that I tied my hands or anything like that. I trap myself inside of flesh. That means I'm stuck in the third dimensional reality. How do we know? Right here. Jamaica. 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 Louisiana. Wow. The art always expresses itself. (laughs) You went from pina coladas to red. What? She went there. You left. I I bet you some some of the other ones did. It was just even it was just a quick flash. Yeah. So a beach. Yeah. Where you at? Ah, thus the handicap. Your mind, when this is gone, we, we go anywhere at the speed of thought, faster than the speed of thought, which is the fastest measurement of anything in the universe, faster than the speed of light. Because we went there, boom, just like that. But the third dimensional reality is thick and slow because it's solidified, the molecule. They vibrate at a slower rate. Okay? So that's how God got trapped. So God has to say the handicap is I gotta learn how to, you know, move this thing and do this, you know, until I get it fluid. Until I can get to a point where I am Jimi Hendrix, I am, you know, um, James Brown, I am Muhammad Ali. I can express my godhood in this cage, because that's how bad I am. Even in this cage, even in this slow dimension, watch what I expressed and manifest on this planet. But I'm still corrupted. I still have the trap of corruption because I have the trap of feelings and emotions and the illusion that I think this thing is real. Anybody know any of the Orishas? Anybody ever heard of Shango? Shango. Of course you did. I see that you did. (laughs) Who's Shango? <laughs> yes, you did. Your other your yeah, spirit brings it. <laughs> Anybody know who or what Shango is? I only know that he likes red and alcohol. Okay, he's a warrior. <laughs> he's a warrior. Anybody else? Shango? Lightning. Mm-hmm. Okay. So protection. Protection. Yeah. Yeah, no, some of you I was just going to say that um, jungle represents cutting away okay. the fire. Fire. Like purification. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Shango. His colors are red and white, correct? Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, he represents the energy of circumspection. That's what he is see everything. That's why he's the king. Okay? Shango in our comedic system is Heru. Okay? In uh, Hindi, he's Krishna. Okay? He's also Mitra. He's also um, uh, Yashua. Okay? And he's also Muhammad Ali. One of the most perfect representations of Shango that I've ever seen. Perfect. Did that. He got that one right. That's Sean. I'm not Ogunish like Mike Tyson. Well, I'm just 
is coming at you. And, you know, I just hit so hard, you gonna fall. I do it pretty strategically while I'm rhyming at the same time. And I am the greatest because I'm the king. Mike never said that. Mike said I'm Iron. Anybody know what Ogun's element is? Iron. Iron. <laughs> Mike even at one point was calling himself the God of War. He's called himself Iron Mike Tyson, but he said he wore the all black which is Ogun's color because he's a blacksmith. And he said, I am the god of war. They put it right in your face. It's just that we are looking for something else. We're looking for them to come through the, through the sky with ancient clothes on. We don't understand that they're pulling up in Bentley and, and you know, Cadillacs. Because they're here now. Okay. Anybody ever heard of Oshun? What is she? Who is she? Mother of the river. She's the mother of the river. She comes to bring balance and okay. you know, sweetness in relationships. Mm-hmm. Like Relationship. Love. Mm-hmm. Spirit river. of love. Balance is love. love. Mm-hmm. Okay. Sweetness. Sweetness. Yeah. Sweetness of life. Well, you, honey. Brackish waters, right? We don't ever talk about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that aspect. Brackish waters. Mm-hmm. That's when she was a prostitute. Oh, she was a mm-hmm. One of the best. Mm-hmm. Right. So the power of love and relationship. So. I will tell you, and I, will, I agree, everything that was said. Oshun is the congregative force of the what holds atoms together. We call that love. We call that consummation. She's congregation. She's a nationalist. She's Bob Marley. She is James Bond. That's no shoe name. Because it's all cloak and dagger. You throw, you throw a big boulder into the river, what does it do? Boulder. Boulder. Oh, boulder. <laughs> But what does the water do? What's the water do? You throw a big heavy rock and blast it up. What else? Uh huh. But does it try to push it out the way? Does it fight it? Yeah. It surrenders to the weight. It surrenders to the weight. It goes around it. Oh. But what does it do while it's going around it? Ripples, but something else. Hugs it. Erosion. Oh. I'm not going to get you today. Mm-hmm. I'm going to get you. Little by little, I'm going to weigh you down until you're just nothing but a little piece of pepper. See, Oshun, that's why Oshun is James Bond. You never saw a James Bond movie where he just goes somewhere and just starts beating everybody up. He's hiding somewhere and he's shooting darts and things like he's cloaking daggers. It's all about the love, and he charms. He even charms the people he's getting ready to kill. That's so sure. <laughs> okay. So again, we're speaking about formulas here, and these are formulas that we all have the potentiality to express ourselves as. But they're stair steps. It's the, the Risha are not for you to serve. They're not put here for that. It's just like the the uh, saying in Kimmet, when Haru was a child, Haru was taken care of by the Neturu. It was like the Arisha in Egypt. But when Haru became a man, he commanded the Neturu. That's speaking about your spiritual maturity. See, as spiritual babies here, we're still looking for something to service and help us help us out with everything. We're so afraid to be in a position where we have nothing to pray to. We're afraid to be that lonely. But you are anyway. Because these are indifferent energy makers. Like, we'll say Oshun loves me. Oshun does not love you. If Oshun loved you, you wouldn't have to give her something to get something. Now, even if you say, no, I just go and I just pray, you're still giving something. You're giving the heat of your body, the force and ashe of your words. That's how this thing works on exchange. Doesn't mean they hate you. 
It's just we have anthropomorphized them to the point where they now have personalities and feelings like we do. They don't have the trap of chakras like we do, where everything has to be moved by the stimulus of emotion. They don't function from that paradigm. They evolve because they are here to put, they just be. The sun is here not to service the earth. The sun is just here. And it sustains life because that's just what it does. And we can tap into the energy or we can decide to worship it. But when you worship the Orisha, they hate you. They hate you. If I'm a king in the royal court and every time there's a decision to be made, I go to the chef and say, what should I do? Eventually he will resent me. Look, man, this is your job. I'm here to, to serve you and keep you strong. I'm a tool, man. You need some, some kale, you need a, a raw food fast, I'll hook it up for you. But you got to do this on yourself. You came in, you were put in this position for you to fulfill a purpose. Not for me to do it for you. I know that's how we're taught here in the diaspora. To serve everything, especially Orisha. That's not how we're taught back home. We're taught Ori rules everything. That's your head. And you have to come into a place of maturity so that you can handle your own issues. That is why Michael Brown got killed. Because what we want to do now is talk about the spiritual significance of him getting killed. How silly is that? Why not protect the gate? What happened to that? You know, why not kill one of them? So we'll send a message. You shouldn't do this again because your child might get killed. We don't want to do that, right? We want to sit here and talk about they and talk about the spiritual significance and he's in a better place. No, that's the conversation we want to have because we don't want to be spiritual adults who are responsible. Yes. I was just wondering, I don't know if y'all talked about this already, but ancestor worship? Mm hmm. First, same thing. We don't worship ancestors. Okay? Because just because someone got killed or they're an ancestor, does that mean that you should listen to them? Just because grandma loves you, does that mean you should listen to them? Some people are just old and simple. They're not elders. They're just old. Some people are not living. They, they, it's okay, sis. They're just dead. Okay, so let, the first thing we want to understand is that a lot of times when we're dealing with our tradition, like even if we're doing like rituals, it might be a, a set like this. The first thing we'll do is I call upon the spirit of the ancestors. Who? Which one? Some of them we don't know. You stay where you at out there. We don't want certain undesirables in our space, uh, living or not living. Okay, so the first understanding is that as Africans, we don't practice necromancy. You might know what necromancy is? Raising the dead. Right. Necro, it means dead person. Okay? A lot of us knew that. Mansi or manshia means to prophesy or to divine. So necromancy is the raising of the dead in order to divine with them. We don't die. No such thing as raising a dead African. They don't die. They have souls. Anything with a soul can't die. I mean, you, we ain't got the power to make that happen. If you don't have a soul, your body can be dead, and then we can give you our shade like you would give blood to a vampire to bring it back into this world so that we can talk to it. It's no different. That's what necromancy is. Quite right, clear on it. So, I'm still answering your question, but that's the precursor. Okay, we go to our Egun for a sympathetic link, or empathetic link. Remember, the Orisha are indifferent energy. They don't care about you. They don't hate you. They don't like you. They're here for a purpose. But more importantly, the reason they don't hate you or like you because they've never lived here. They manifest energies on the planet, and Oshun, who ain't, who's just a forger, I know it's tough to hear, She's just a forger. 
she takes everything that's spiritual and real and puts a beautiful covering on top to affect your five senses. That's why she's laughing in the mirror when she's looking at it. Because she's saying, the mirror is showing something that's fake. And we look at it to see what's real. It's a joke. You fell for it. But the special ones don't. The special ones look at the river and wade through the three-dimensionality of it and look at the spirit inside. They say, no, I, I see you. I see the real river. Or I see the real tree. Or I see the real person. Then know Shun says, I doubt you. What do you need me to do? You pass my test. That's what the Orisha is. So, the, the Egum, as we call them, or the ancestors, they provide an empathetic link because when you lose your child, they know what it feels like. They've lost children. They've hurt. They've cried. They've been happy before. So when you talk to them, they can understand and then they can relay that emotional charge to the Orisha. That's the role that they play. That's just one. But that's one of the roles they play in this whole spiritual ecosystem. They are the link of empathy. Okay? So you would use them for certain things that require empathy. Like if you're going up against another human, somebody's bothering you on a job or whatever. A Mike Brown situation, that's that's an ancestor situation. Okay? Because they know what that feels like. If you deal with the egg with the Orisha, you would have you would have to be very de detailed in what you want. You can't say, Orisha, um, bring justice to the situation that happened. Because all they're going to look at is the loss of Ashe. Okay, so I just need to replace that Ashe. No problem, I'll burn out a star. No, that's not what I wanted. I wanted him. You didn't say that. We don't work on that. We only work on the laws of balance. Not empathy. You better go to your ancestors for that. So it's a formula. Give them some yes, sir. Formula is a thing, or is how does one use the formula? By first understanding the components of it. Okay. Um, you would use the formula, the formula of the Orisha based on what you want. But because they've been anthropomorphized, we can kind of understand the formulas a little bit sometimes. But we got to look beyond the story. For instance, we're told that when Ogun and Yemoja come together, that um, there's a story about Ogun saying something, he was talking about her breasts, he said, your breasts are so long. And Yemoja said, well, your balls hang so long. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> I think that would be funny. <laughs> um, so, um, she was hurt and she ran out and she was crying and she went and became a river. And Ogun, he went and worked 24 hours, you know, because he was hurt that he lost his woman. That's just one of the stories. Okay. Um, so, what they're telling you in that formula is that when you put salt water together with iron, it will rust the iron. That's all. See, that's the formula. You know. So then they'll say, oh, don't put them together. They're not good together. No, they're good if you want oxidation. Yeah, they're good. If you want that iron to rust and show its blood to you, put them together. You see. So you start learning the formulas, formulas by learning the base properties of each Orisha. Each Orisha has a science that's associated with it. Like I said, Shango is circumspection. Oya is the supplanting of power. Um, Oshun is, is the congregative force. Obatala is, is, is um, omnipresence. Um, Olokun represents space. Okay, the science of space. Yemoja is instantaneous healing. Okay, she's a salt water. Um, you know, and it goes on. Eshu is the energy of segregation. Okay. Or you might call him a legba. A legba. Okay. His original name was Eshu, and one of his aspects is the legbara, which means a person of great power and strength. So when we came here, we would chant that a lot. The legbara, because I'm about to crack these chains. You know, I'm about to fly off the landing and go back home. I'm about to walk across the sea and get out of here. Let me chant for the legbara. And the people heard that, and they, they said, the legba. Then they broke it down from there and just said legba. That's that's Elek Bauer, a person of great strength. Okay? But the segre segregated force lives at the crossroads. That's okay. what I was about to ask you. Uh -huh. <laughs> Segregation. Yes, sir. No, I was just about to ask you that very thing. Okay. Because I remember seeing the movie Crossroads. 
Lost Roads with uh, Joe, what's the name? And, uh, uh, Ralph Macchio. Yeah, right. down in the Delta. Right. Yeah, yeah. And he met at the crossroad and had to go to speak with Legba. Legba. And he yeah. came pulled up in the Corvette. Right. He said, what you want, Willie Brown? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's what Black Love about to ask, but you said crossroads in the next phrase. Because at that moment, I have to make a choice. Now, it's like Oshun trickster. Elegba is a trickster. He's trying to trick you into picking your divinity. He doesn't want you to go left or right. That's the secret. He wants you to go into the middle of the cross. So he would say, well, if you go over here, this is happening. Why don't you go over there? He's showing you left and right, and you got to stand and say, nah, I'm going to take you to the middle. If you sure you want to go through the middle, all your family going to leave you. They're going to call you crazy. Take me through the middle. I don't know. I don't, I don't want to work with polarities anymore. That's a trap of humanity. The most high doesn't, doesn't work with polarities. Most High has no traps of off and on binary code. So then he'll keep playing with you until he's sure you want to go through the middle, which is the heart chakra. And then you'll go through the middle of the circle or a zodiac. You'll, you'll say, I don't want to be a Leo anymore. I don't want to be Aquarius. I don't want to be a, take me in. I want to be the 13th. I don't want to be one of the 12 apostles or 12 disciplines. I've mastered these disciplines. I'm ready to be the Christ. Take me through the center of the circle. That's where that shooting leg box is trying to get us to do. So, people like me are created who come to offend your ego, to tell your ego that grow up. They don't. They, they they serve you. You don't serve them. Take control. They're asking you to pilot the ship. Eshu wants you to pilot the ship because Eshu and all of these other Arisha and angels are astral energies. They're spirits. Spirits don't last. They end when they're no longer needed. We only still have Bob Marley's presence because we keep wearing his shirts and playing his music. We won't stop talking about it. Stop talking about it. Bob, the spirit of Bob Marley will die. The soul will, will, soul probably done came back two, three times already, all the children. But the spirit is gone. The spirit is only here because we keep feeding the spirit. Stop feeding it, it dies. You see? If you stop feeding it. And when you get to the point when you make it back home and you've evolved back to your highest place, which I don't even know what that looks like. I'm not supposed to know because I wouldn't be able to handle it if I found out. I would explode. I can only talk to you about the reflection of my higher self, but I could never be here. I could just reflect. So when we get to that point, when we get back home, okay, more importantly, that's the point when the Arisha are no longer needed. When everybody gets back. Everyone's coming. Everyone's coming. Whether they're coming kicking or screaming, they're coming. Because we're all attached to Olu Dumari, right? The serpent. Dambala. But those of us in this room, see, you see how all the chairs are filled up? Now, I know you're getting some good information. It's not like I'm just in here talking about fairy tales. I'm giving you some stuff that can help you live. But all the chairs ain't filled. I don't care. Because I only want to work with the nucleus. The nucleus is what makes the cell move. Not the mass energy and space around the nucleus that makes up the bigger part of it. It's the small little tiny nucleus that makes the mass of it move. I just want the nucleus. Y'all move the snake. I just want the head of the snake. That's the smallest part. The body is in the coil. That's most of it. But it's just sitting still, stagnant in a coil. And then what we like to do, I go back to Michael Brown, we like to take the head of the snake and face it back towards the coil to try to service the masses, to service the coil. But if the coil is stuck down in the root chakra or in human reality, what's the best service that you could do for it? Because wherever the head goes, what happens to the body? Follows Whether it wants to or not. Whether it wants to or not, it's going to go. A lot of us didn't like Martin Luther King. This is what it was. A lot of us said he was a troublemaker. But because
because of what he did, because he said, man, I ain't going to go back and keep trying to service you something. I'm going to keep myself surrounded by the women, because that's where the power is in. And I'm just going to keep marching forward and keep doing what I got to do. And now you can stand in the middle of him and, and you can gather. No matter how we feel about him or his politics, because he ignored how we felt about him, we can now gather in groups and I can talk to all of them as I want. So, it's not about servicing the masses. It's about moving forward, advancing the head of the snake, and then the body will come along. That's why everybody's coming. Everybody. But then once the snake is, is back home, all the spirits that were here as tools to help the snake to elevate are no longer necessary. So they dissipate. Unless you choose to take them with you. But you can't take them with you if you can't see them. You can't see them as long as you're dealing with them from a master-slave relationship. Begging them, help me out with this. When you come to them as a pair, you get to see the whole of them. When you look at Eshu, when you look at Shango, you say, look, man, I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. Go take care of this. What do you need to do? How much energy do you need for this one? Oh, okay, you need some apples? Okay, you need some rum, you need some cinnamon, you need some Florida water. I got you. Here's your payment. Go handle that. When you learn to function from that perspective, that's how I speak to them. Why would I make up a fake voice because I'm in my shrine? That's not authentic. That's not my art. The word for art means authentic. It's not true and real. So by that by that advancement, I can now take them and that's the desire. That's why they hate when you worship them. Because when you worship them and come under them, they don't have chances to go to the next level. Everything wants to ascend and transform. Arisha don't have soul. They don't have will. They would like to have it. But you don't give them that opportunity as long as you function like a slave. Any questions? So to... Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. I got you. Oh, so to, to, to learn to, to keep your... Self in your mind away from the distractions that are so common as we're so used to. There's just more practice. It's just you gotta be it's aware now that you're aware of them making the practice. It's more eyesight. You have to see the stories under the stories. You know, so when things occur, you can you can go for the you can decide from which part of your body you want to react with. You can come from your lower nature. <laughs> And start doing a whole lot of intellectual masturbation and this is what they're doing and this is what they 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 the day the day they people you know or you can come from up here and, and sit back and science it up. So, you basically should trust yourself. But trust it's, your inside or you kinda of trust to see what you're really seeing. What is this really yeah, like? because you know like, I don't have feelings that everybody else is having and I'm thinking something is wrong with me because I'm not emotional about that like mm-hmm. you're saying. But I'm seeing maybe now. I should listen. You should, yeah. If it's like, I don't really need to be concerned. If there is a concern about it, use it as a compass first. And the compass should be, why should I look at this? Let that be the compass. You know, when Trayvon Martin happened, I didn't really care. You know, I didn't really, because I knew I didn't, and I knew no one else did too, because if all you're going to do is put on a hoodie, you don't care. Come on now, you got enough money to make this man disappear, some of these people, and you just gonna put a sweatshirt on. You don't care. But I looked at it because it did affect me. So don't think when I say I don't care, I'm saying it's it's invisible to me. I'm just saying I'm not emotionally invested, but I did make an intellectual investment. And just real quick, some stuff came to me. And I said it in a lecture one, I said, this is how we get distracted. I'll share with you. I said, and it just came to me in a second. Uh, when I was at that lecture, but it was it was effective. Trayvon Martin, right? Um, anybody anybody even deal with astrology? Before I answer that, but the point is, all of that intellectual conscious masturbation it's a distraction a lot of times. Now, was there a connection? Obviously. Look at all of that that I just pointed out. Right. So what? And uh, <laughs> you know, because if you ain't going to posse up to go kill Zimmerman, don't let that matter. Anymore. I'm on some stones, plants, whatever, you know. Okay, this is what's happening. 
when you see those images when you're meditating, especially when you're focused on the first eye, like I said, when you're seeing animals like that, the first thing you want to check is how you feel about it. That's number one. Mm-hmm. Try to, try to, because I know sometimes the feeling change, you want to try to remember, even if you got a document. Mm-hmm. That hey, will I show right. Yeah, that's the first thing. But write down not just what you saw, how you felt. You might mm-hmm. feel scared, you might feel happy, this, that, that, and the third. Your feelings are a compass. They're not worthless. I want you to understand that. You use them as a compass to guide you in as far as your interactions with things. Because you're not feeling afraid, these are telling what you're seeing is powers that you have. And what you might even have sometimes is dreams where those animals are chasing you. Okay, that means you're running from your power. What you should do is turn around and face them and let them absorb you, or you absorb them. Okay, so these are energies that are trying to contact you and say, hey, I want to be with you, I want to help you. I can give you the hearing of the jackal, or I can give you the sight of the hawk, all these different things like that. So if you're feeling afraid, and sometimes it could be something similar, but a lot of times it's an energy or a power that we have that we're repressing. So you might see, that's what I say, well, what other things? Sometimes you'll see like what looks like sea creatures, like all distorted images, like monsters, basically. That's the things that you don't want to deal with. Them. And if you take something, even a fish or an animal, and you constantly put pressure on it, it's going to deform its shape. It's going to look ugly, quote unquote. Okay? So that's what that represents. Those are, in, those are powers that you have, and you got to start taking them on one by one. What you do is take the book that you have and look at an animal that you may have seen. And next time you're either doing your prayers or whatever it is that you do or you're going through a situation, ask them to help you. Like, especially like, say, if it's time for you to go do your prayers, but you're feeling tired. You don't, just don't feel like it tonight. Okay. What you do is you call the say, if you see squirrels, represent resourcefulness. What you do. I squirrels, but I feed the squirrels in my yard. That represents that you need to start looking at your internal resources. Okay. That means that stop looking for more stuff. Look, look at this, like, it's her. You have to find it. It's her. When the baby needs something, she makes it happen. The baby knows whatever I want to eat is going, going to come down here. I'm going to get it. Okay? Because she can take inventory of everything that's around her and see what can be used. Okay? That's what it's saying to me. So that's when you want to start tapping that way. But when you're feeling tired, you don't feel like doing something, ask that energy to assist you, that animal spirit. Okay? And you'll start seeing it going to start manifesting more, more and more. That's what it's coming. You know, like that, that's what I'm saying. It, it, I don't be afraid. Right. You know. That's good. It's just when I when I go there, it shows me like about shamanism, mm-hmm. different stuff like that. Like right. I said, I'm, I'm I'm on a path right now, and, and it's been like for years, you know. And I just start, you know, searching. Right. Stop searching. We, our ancestors already searched for us. Mm-hmm. If, 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 if you had a, a statue, let's say this painting here, right? Let's say for 500 years, all of us went energy and channeled it into this painting. If we all just kept channeling and channeling and channeling. You know, at the end of that 500 years, that painting would say, I'm good, you ain't got to give me nothing more. I'm alive now. Millions of years of your ancestors praying and chanting and doing rituals and making pyramids and and writing and music and all these different things and deposited it into the DNA pool. Now, you have the gift of all of that. So you don't have to do blood sacrifices every five minutes. You don't actually have to do any of them. You don't have to sacrifice as much as they did because they already deposited all that ashe into you. You ain't got to search no more. Because of all of those past life, which is now in your DNA chain, you just got to tap into it. You might find you pay, play 30 different instruments. And it's not because you're just so talented. That just signifies your ability to tap into those, uh, to those ancestors and the talents that they have. So you don't have to go out searching for new talents. Just use the old ones. Or new answers. That's why I say it's all the answers in you. No, the ancestors. Talk to the ancestors the same way we talk to the original? Um, I don't. 
Um, and it's only because I consider the ancestors to be my elders. You know, I consider the ancestors to be older than me. The Orisha are not older than me. So you're asking for the humanity of the Orisha. You're asking. I don't believe really, them because they're working with me. With my ancestors, I don't ask them still because it's a, it's a, it's a hand in hand thing. You know? Um, you know they're with you. Know they're with you. They're with but so are the Orisha, but the Orisha are here to serve. Now, my ancestors, if they're showing up and they're speaking to me, they're mainly showing up because they need something. See, we always look at the ancestors are coming to help. They help us, but at the same time, they need our help. If you had an Egun or an ancestor that when he was in or she was in this life, they lived nothing but a wasteful duration of life, right? And they now transition. They're going to come to you because, you, remember, ancestors live in the dark. You keep thinking, like, we have movies and they come down in the light. They don't live in light. They live in the dark. Your light. So the more, the cleaner your blood is, literally, the more you do your liver cleanses and stuff like that, and the higher your vibration is, the easier they can see you become like a lighthouse. Okay, that's why we light candles for them. So they can see their way to whatever it is that we're doing. So they need you more than you need them. And I'm not saying that to really be arrogant with them, just explaining the relationship. Because I guarantee you, whoever's sitting here, if you count through your family, all the family that you know, right, that's living right now, I bet you you're the only conscious one. What we define as conscious. You don't only elevate it, one with elevated awareness. Now, you might have an aunt or something where she has dreams and stuff like that, but you're probably the only one who's deliberately pursuing the path. Now, we've been here for billions of years now, even before we came up in the physical form. So now, imagine now you got a lineage of a billion ancestors that are trying to express themselves in this time. And only one person has the gate open. So now all of them rush in like this. That's why when we first come into consciousness, we start having all these crazy dreams. And I hear them talking. Oh man, I wish they'd be quiet. Because they, they finally come on, right, I got you, I need you to do something. Go to my house, go to my attic. Remember I used to live going there? There's a picture in there. I need you to take it to my gravesite. They start giving you all these assignments because nobody else is awake, so everybody's got a funnel through you. So when I say they need you more than you need them, it's not an arrogant thing. Like, wait, wait your turn. Make that type of thing like that. But you make it very clear that this is a give and take exchange. You need something from me and I'm going to need something from you. So we can talk now just, you know, like peers. But I still call my, my grandfather, that Baba, you know, Mama. You know, I still speak to them in that sense. But in the same instance, I don't follow the direction totally. When I first came into the tradition, I remember sitting at my ancestral shrine and my grandmother would speak to me very clearly. And she said, I want you to be a minister. And I said, Grandma, I ain't, that ain't happening. <laughs> I said, you know, she said, you, you have such a way where people listen to you. Yeah, I want you, because so I, I said, Grandma, what do you want from me? You know, I was trying to like set up my shrine, like, do you want me to put something here, put some water? She said, I want you to be a minister. So I said, Grandma, I'm going to be something better than that. And what I did was I took the uh, book of Coming Forth by Day, which we call the book, they called the Book of the Day. And what I did was I set up a candle on the shrine, and I put the book there. And every day, I kept the candle going. This candle was going for like months. Every day I turned the page. I would do it. So when the sun would rise, the sun would come up, I turn the page, you know, I would speak to them, Grandma. It's, I mean, sometimes I would read that page, you see. And, and, and I would do that. And then I took a book on Yoruba. I think, I, it, was, I think it was a Yoruba English dictionary. And I would just read it, turn the page, but with a candle there. So I, what I did was I educated my ego in something they didn't know. So now they can say, now I can do some stuff, you know, and I can get out of this realm I'm stuck in. I went to go communicate with ego one time, and I was just telling somebody last night in, in, in something, I asked a question, and I go, I went to that realm. It was, this happened twice. One, I went in a realm to go speak to an uncle of mine who transitioned. And in his realm, everybody was gambling. I was like, I was walking through a big casino. Everybody, it was like just gambling. Because whatever it is that they're doing in this life, consistently, that's, the, that's what their heaven is. So I go and I'm speaking to another Egun, 
and we sitting in church. We sitting out a pew, but there was no sermon going. So I, I remember saying, why are we here? What, 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 what's up? What are we doing? And she said, we waiting for the Lord of all the world to come back. But she was like, he coming back. He going to see you. He coming back. Because she's still waiting for Jesus to come back. Because that's all she was waiting for when she was alive. That's why when you go by churches at night, especially when it's raining, you always see something moving inside. Always. Go there when it's raining, you'll see figures. That's the spirits. That's your ancestors still waiting for Jesus to come back. So I started teaching them. This is who Jesus was. And I would just sit at my shrine. I would be reading books. Um, I would have um, like Dr. Ben playing. I had this little portable DVD at that time. And I would put, put the DVD player on the shrine. And I would leave it playing like 24 hours. Uh, yeah. Because <laughs> I mean, he'd say, he better not can. <laughs> and I would just leave it playing, 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 playing. I would, and all my books that I would get, like whenever I get a new book, I would leave it on the shrine. You know, so the shrine of all the Bible right, was all books. You know, and this is how I elevated my egun, and I cracked my egun out of that realm, that church realm. She she ascended. I helped her get out of it. I saw when she left, and I said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa!" And and what happened was things. It was like um, it was almost like a wrecking ball hit. Things started crumbling. Anybody, have anybody ever seen the movie Inception? Yeah. Okay. Remember when he would realize that he was dreaming? When they would, people they would realize they were in dream state and everything would start like tidal waves and all that start happening uh -huh. because the walls of the reality would crumble. That, so I deal with them. It's a different, you know, it's a different type of vibration that we deal with. I'm trying to get, I'm trying to, if they're ancestors, that's beautiful. No knock against the ancestors, but if your ancestors are ancestors and you can contact their fullness, that means they didn't make it back home. If they're coming back here or you can still catch them on the astral planes, they didn't make it back. I got some goon I can't find. You know, I got an Uncle Larry who I loved as a child. And when I first started coming, I said, oh, man, I'm talking to Uncle Larry. That was, that was my man. He died of cancer. I couldn't find Uncle Larry anywhere. And then one, one night, I got a glimmer. And he said, that's not my name anymore. That's all I got. I said, oh, he's gone. Like, he's gone, gone. Good. <laughs> he, you know, he made it back home. So, I'm, so I don't even bother him anymore. Because I'm not gonna try to pull that energy back. Nah, no, I see you. I'm trying. I'm trying to get there myself. I see when I get there. You know, but the other ones I can still contact with. I feed them. I feed my goon more. I don't even ask for much from them because when you're feeding, them, they're gonna take care of you. You know, they're gonna make sure you get just like when you if you got an elder now, start the process now because whatever you do as above, so below, you're gonna reflect that in the heavens. My, my elders, I, I see, I call them all the time. As we was going from state to state, I'm calling. Yeah, I'm sensitive sense now. I'm sense now. Yeah, you know how you are, man. Watch your mouth, man. You know how you are with them. You know, they down, you down south now. You know, I'm hearing all that, getting all that, that counsel. Some of it's inaccurate, you know, because I'm not, I ain't got no attitude. All right, all right, grandma. Yeah, I know, I, know. I ain't going to say nothing to them. I know, I know, I know. You know, but what happens is when we on the phone, it's also... You need anything? Nah, I'm cool, Grandpa. You need anything? I'm cool. You see? So when you're con when you're contacting your egun, your ancestors, I'm talking about something that's in the physical world, but in the spiritual world, they'll say, take care of this and this and that for him because he talks to me. And as long as he keeps this communication, as long as he's feeding me, I'm going to feed him because I want to keep having these dialogues with him. But I can't, he won't come talk to me if he's stressed out about his mortgage. You know, or if he's stressed out about is his baby safe, or he wants more children, he can't have them, you know, because no ancestors are coming back to him. We'll take care of the other stuff by default because we, he's, he's, he's connected with us. You see? So that's a long explanation, but I think it's very important. You know, that's how I, I deal with my people. And we have a good old time. And the same way I'm talking to you is how I talk to him. When I'm at the shrine, what's going on, Grandma? What you been up to? That's just how I talk, like I'm talking right now. You know, we crack jokes. Sometimes I'll be walking, you know, and I, I mean, one time when I first really heard my grandmother loud, I'll never forget, I, I had a court date. I was dealing with something, and I'm praying to her. Like, you know, grandma, just let me get in and out of here. Don't let me start yelling at this judge or nothing like that. You know? And I'm walking up, up, and I'm like trying to relax. I was doing this breathing meditation while I was walking. 
and I tripped. <laughs> you know, I went and I did I had a briefcase and everything, and I just <laughs> did one of them and kept going. And I heard his laughter, and I and then I heard somebody always sees you, son. Because <laughs> I looked around, I said, there wasn't nobody on the street. I was like, okay, nobody saw that. And then I heard laughter, and somebody always sees you, son. <laughs> so I said, okay, that's how we're playing, son. You made me trip, so I would relax. <laughs> okay, so we, we, we'll play it. But that's how I deal with it, man. There's no artificial, nothing. No, all ancestors I come before you, they gonna be like, well, who is this? <laughs> <laughs> that ain't him. <laughs> you know, so you just gotta be my aunt. You gotta be authentic. You know. Um, but the Orisha is a little different. With the Orisha, I mean I may joke and laugh, but with them it's more like it's more of a command thing. Like sometimes when they come to me when I don't feel like talking, they like, nah man, come back later. A goon used to do that all the time. Wake me up in the middle of the night. Nah man, I gotta sleep. We talk about this tomorrow. You know, and that's how I would I got don't wake me back up. And I would go back to sleep. But in the dawn, I'll be right down in my shrine, feeding them. All right, man, what's up? What did you want to tell me? He's getting fed though. You know, you got rum and gin all over him. What's up? You know. So it's a, it's a little different, but you have to go by your own disposition, your own orin, because your orisha are your orisha. My ogun is not your ogun. You see, my ogun is in my heart chakra. My oshun is in my solar chakra. Yours is in yours. Yours may communicate completely different. My oshun likes likes to listen to Millie Jackson. She likes the um, the F you song. You know, I don't think y'all ever heard that. And I I used to date a oshun priest. One time I was like, you know, I was playing. And she was like, you don't turn that mess off. Oshun don't want to hear that. All right, I'm turning it off for you. But my Oshun thinks it's funny. She loves Millie Jackson because that's her daughter. So you got to go. It's a personal thing. There's a saying in Yoruba. The Ori that leaves in the dawning is not the Ori that returns at night. And what that means is that your day's experiences, are, you're supposed to make them profound to the point that it, it renews your thinking. It renews the way you see the world. But in order for there to be a rebirth and renewal, it must first be a death and a destruction. So I try to destroy people in order for new people. When you walk out, I want you to be a new person. And even if it's just one point, if it's one thing that you learn, I know I destroyed you. If it's just, it could just be one point that you took in and said, now that's true. That's true. Well, that person who walked in didn't know that that was true. So that means that person's dead. I don't stand here to get to give you stuff that you can do this to. Because then I'm not giving you nothing that's destroying you. And the same person is walking back out the door. But you just got more better self-esteem. You don't need anyone. You already know we built everything. You already know we invented everything. You already know the person.